All right. Uh, we're going to talk about wetlands and a little bit about wetland management uh, in two, two distinct ways that we commonly manage wetlands for wildlife. So a wetland is basically an area that's saturated with water and that could vary in the length of time. So you may have fluctuations within the day in water, such as in tidal systems that may be permanently flooded or just seasonally uh, be flooded. So uh, the main thing is that there's the influence of water is great enough that the characteristics take on a distinct ecosystem. And the distinctive characteristics, like if you were trying to identify if a place is a wetland, there are three characteristics that we would look for. One, the land is inundated or saturated with water at some point, right? Uh, two, the soils have uh, experienced anoxic conditions. So we can, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, you probably know what I'm talking about already if you've taken soils, but Basically, is there hydric soils present? Also, are there wetland obligate plants, so aquatic vegetation? We'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of vegetation uh, groups that we, we would look for, but is that present? And if these distinct characteristics are present, then we would classify it as a wetland. That's pretty important to think about from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, because we have special protect protections uh, that we base on whether or not something is classified as a wetland. So pretty important from a policy standpoint, but also understanding those characteristics uh, so that you can understand from a wildlife management standpoint how to uh, address issues that arise. So the hydrology in a wetland is by far the most important driver uh, of the function of that system. It is the most important physical parameter. A lot of people would have probably said soils. I hear that pretty commonly, but that's that, that is, there's no question that that's important, but it definitely plays a secondary role to the water cycle. So uh, another thing that is really important for you to realize is that we often have waterways that have a floodplain associated with them or wetlands that have a floodplain. So we're basically talking about the surrounding watershed. Anywhere in upland areas where water is coming from can influence uh, the quality of the wetland or the function of the wetland. And particularly think about this from a land use standpoint, like if we have agriculture or development occurring in a watershed that can certainly affect the wetlands quality or function, uh, even though they're not directly associated with one another, right? We're just talking about an indirect influence by influencing water. So pretty important to think about when we're managing wetlands. So when we talk about hydrology, the, the two things that we think about most would be the duration. So how long is an area inundated? And then how frequently is that occurring? And again, this can be, uh, have all sorts of schedules and their, you know, nature uh, creates variability in these schedules, right? So uh, you never know within a given wetland what that water cycle might be like every year. We have some general trends, but it's certainly variable from year to year. But, uh, you know, the, the main takeaway is that how long and the frequency of inundation are very important. And one reason that they're so important is because they really influence the plant communities that are associated with it and a lot of the other organisms as a result. Something we're gonna talk about is a green tree reservoir. That's one uh, pretty important management practice. It's really used widely on refuge systems where uh, they're trying to emulate the function of bottomland hardwood wetlands like this. So they're seasonally flooded uh, forest stands, bottomland forests. So if we look at the soils, this is the modeling that we were talking about. Essentially, uh, you're seeing, well, it tells you on here, uh, you're seeing the iron in the uh, soil is basically rusting. So you're seeing evidence that the, the, there's anoxic conditions and saturation. Uh, 
a lot of these different characteristics are pretty important to the management of wet, wetlands. It's really important from a legal standpoint, but it's also important but for dictating what kinds of plants can colonize and be sustained there. Not many plants can uh, handle being inundated, especially during the growing season because of uh, the anoxic condition, anaerobic conditions in the soil. So uh, just to give you an example, one, one adaptation of plants that's pretty key is called erinchyma. So you can Google that erinchyma, but it's basically these little, these little uh, chambers within the plant that allow the plant to capture oxygen above the water surface and transport it down to the roots. So that's one adaptation of, of uh, several that plants might use to, to circumvent this, but it's really important to think about the anaerobic conditions and grow, relative to growing season because in places like our green tree reservoirs, we don't want to kill the trees. So it's pretty important to understand uh, how long flooding can happen and, and the importance of timing. So when we're thinking about uh, plant life, uh, like I said, one of the things uh, that's a key adaptation is erinchyma, and uh, that just allows the oxygen tra transfer from the upper part of the plant down to the roots, which is uh, a pretty critical thing. When we're thinking about the classifications of plants, uh, we have emergent rooted, and that's basically they rooted in the, the soil, but they grow above the water surface. So bald cypress is a great example, but rushes, cattails, all of these plants you probably see around campus, even if you look at some of the, the water holes on campus, uh, you'll see some of these plants established. Submerged rooted is a little bit more difficult to see because they're beneath the water surface, but still a really common feature, especially in uh, the photo zone or yeah, in the uh, photoactive zone within water. So you basically have a column of water where uh, light is penetrating far enough. That's normally where a lot of these plants will reside. Uh, the floating leaf roots are probably familiar with water lily or water lotus or uh, what's, uh, lily pads. Th those are uh, floating leaved rooted plants. So they're rooted in the soil, but their leaves are actually floating on the surface. Also, we have the, the uh, floating plants, uh, floating plants and roots, which hang free from the surface, and uh, they normally flower right on the surface. So some of these uh, you may mistake for lily pads or water lilies, but they're actually in this other plant class. All of these things are characteristic of wetlands and they, you know, having those plants present would help us to uh, determine whether a place it actually is a wetland. <clears throat> and that leads me to wetland classification. And I can't stress how important this is uh, for us to realize what things uh, are occurring in in the wetland and allow us to determine that it's a wetland because it's so important, especially you know when we're talking about human activities and restriction on uh, where we can build or uh, establish. Uh, certain land uses often fall on uh, their, in, you know, are, are regulated based on their impacts on wetlands. So that's a really important uh, uh, thing for us to understand. Some of the really common ones, uh, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, that's what MAV is. So, so enormous uh, floodplain associated with the Mississippi River. All rivers have uh, floodplains like this. That one just happens to be real big. And uh, normally associated with those floodplains are seasonally flooded bottomland hardwoods. Okay, they're often oak dominated, but sometimes they'll, you know, depending on where you're at and what the water is like, we'll have cypress associated with it and other plants like that, but uh, really common. One that's particularly important, especially for a lot of our wild waterfowl species are moist, what we'd call moist soil wetlands. This is also another thing that we manage really commonly for wildlife and wetlands. 
and this is basically a canopy opening and uh, the you know water is seasonal on the moist soil so you have part of the growing season generally is exposed now these water cycles can change dramatically but i'm just talking about in general in most of the southeast most of the time the natural flood cycles are for uh you know we'll start uh seeing flooding into the fall through the winter and uh into the spring and then we'll see the water recede and be you know the wetland soils will be exposed during the growing season and that's pretty important if you think about that cycle relevant relative to other things that are occurring like waterfowl or overwintering in the south that happens to be when the, the wetlands are filled so that's a pretty important process also a lot of our plants are well adapted to to establish and grow and produce flowers and seeds during the summer which happens to be when the wetlands naturally would be uh, exposed for plants to do that. Uh, we also have a couple of other really common ones. I've just kind of uh, listed some of them. If you're interested in these, uh, take a look online at some of these systems. But the main point is we have a diversity of different wetland classifications and they all have their own important functions from a wildlife standpoint. So. We're going to talk about the bottomland hardwood. We would manage it. It would be called a green tree reservoir and also moist soil wetlands, which we manage really commonly. Uh, we also have some pretty important wildlife species, too, that are common in the southeast would be the American alligator and the North American beaver. Both of these are keystone species, meaning that they change the environment such that it creates a unique structure for habitat for other species and itself. Uh, both of those species are known, or excuse me, ecosystem engineers. Both of these are known as ecosystem engineers. I don't um, miss putting that on the American alligator. And they're you know that the ecosystem engineer part means that they're constructing. Uh, a habitat component by modifying the environment and the fact that they do it in a way that affects their own habitat and the habitat of many other species that's what makes them a keystone species i apologize for uh, messing that up but uh, most people know about beavers being an ecosystem engineer and how important that is for the creation of, of wetlands Less people I find know about the American alligator. They really commonly will make these big wallow pools that they overwinter in and a lot of species are uh, associated with those wetlands that are created. <clears throat> so let's talk about green tree reservoir management for a minute. Basically we're talking about a forest, right? So it's typically an oak, bottomland oak species dominated and a lot of our waterfowl species are really uh, dependent on acorn production but also for that to occur in a wetland. So think about uh, you know, oaks or produce or developing acorns up through the fall and then they start dropping them through from the fall through the winter into the spring, depending on the species. And generally, uh, we have systems set up where we can create a green tree reservoir and that often uh, requires us to have some sort of water control structure so that we can catch water and uh, really commonly that'd be like a drop board riser so look up drop board riser if you're not sure what that is but it, it's essentially a, a drain put in a, a, a levee or dam that we can drop boards in literally drop boards in to change the height of water by allowing more or less water to drain in at a different level so if we drop the boards in, we can continue to increase the water level before it's able to fall into the drain. That's how we would raise the water level. Most of the time, uh, we would be basically dropping those boards in the fall and then allowing the wetland to be inundated through the spring. And uh, sometime in the spring, we would then uh, remove the water. It's also desirable to have a relatively low basal area. So you remember in the the uh, the uh, 
woodland management lecture, I was talking about the importance of sunlight and what that woodland structure is. You think about when we were removing half of the trees and some of those things, we'd be getting down in the 50 to 60 basal area range. The picture I showed you of the longleaf pine savanna, that's probably down closer to to uh, 15 or 20 basal area. So it kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like. But basically in this 40 to 80 range, we're getting a large portion of the sunlight to penetrate down. And a lot of plants will respond while the, the uh, green tree reservoir is, is uh, dry. During the summer, a lot of plants will respond to that and colonize. And those can be pretty important from a habitat structure and even food production standpoint. A lot of, uh, of the waterfowl that use them may be eating invertebrates. So a lot of the plants that colonize in that green tree reservoir might be important for that. But in most cases, we are specifically using the green tree reservoir uh, to manage species that eat acorns. A lot of waterfowl species do. <clears throat> when we're looking at uh, moist soil wetlands, it's a very similar idea to the, what we were talking about with green tree reservoirs. But in this case, it's basically like a grassland. So in other words, we don't have any or very little forest cover. Uh, capturing sunlight, almost full, if not full, sunlight penetration to the ground. And the idea with this is that we're trying to maximize seed production. Okay, so we generally would drain these on the same kind of cycle just after the growing season be begins within a month or, or a little over a month, up to three months, but uh, depends on what your objective is and where you are. Uh, but the main idea is that we expose it during the growing season. So a lot of our native plant, annual plant species can colonize it. So you're seeing a lot of annual grasses in this to encourage uh, some of those same species. We also, once, once we have drawn down the water off of it and it dries out during the summer, we might use disking or burning to help stimulate these. Particularly if we start getting shrubby species or perennial species dominating, uh, we would use particularly disking in that case. So basically bring in a tractor with disk implements uh, behind it to break up the soil and reset succession so that we're dominated by these annual plant species. The reason that we want these annual plants is because the seed production on them is so tremendous. Okay. Uh, in general, annual plants, they have a very short life cycle, right? They germinate from a seed grow the entire plant, flower, and then produce their seed within the same growing season. A perennial plant can get established. They normally invest a lot into root development, especially long-term perennial. Uh, so, right, or uh, even more for trees. So the idea with this sort of system is that we really want to encourage colonization by these annual plants that put a tremendous amount of effort into producing seeds because that seed production is the primary reason that a lot of our wildlife species, particularly waterfowl, are using those wetlands. So that's the target is to maximize seed production. And that's usually annual grasses with some annual forbs in wetland systems. We'll talk about the disking and burning a little more in a little more detail in, a, in a, the next lecture and why we actually get some of these annual plants, but just know that that's our target in this system. All right, I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I did want to uh, show you this guide. There's a lot of good information in here. Uh, make sure you read through this. I might pull a question or two from it, but I also wanted you to have it as a resource uh, if you wanted it, because it uh, gives you some good guidelines on moist soil management. And I appreciate the, the time and uh, talk to you next time.